Welcome to the China in the World podcast, a series of discussions examining China's foreign policy and shifting engagement with the world. The China in the World podcast is brought to you by Carnegie China and hosted by me, Paul Hanley. Welcome back to the China in the World podcast. On today's episode, I'm excited to partner with CSIS's Asia Chessboard podcast, hosted by Jude Blanchett, Freeman Chair in China Studies at CSIS, and Dr. Michael Green, CEO of the United States Study Center in Sydney, Australia. In this podcast, Jude interviews myself and Dr. Green and Faryar Shirzad, former Deputy National Security Advisor for International Economic Affairs, about the newly published book, Handoff, the Foreign Policy George W. Bush Passed to Barack Obama. Together, we discuss the key pillars of the Bush administration's China policy, what went right and what went wrong, and how China has evolved over the course of the last two decades. For our listeners that haven't heard of the Asia Chessboard podcast, the podcast features in-depth conversations with the most prominent strategic thinkers on Asia. Jude and Mike take the debate beyond the headlines of the day to explore the historical context and inside decision-making process on major geopolitical developments from the Himalayas to the South China Sea. Hope you enjoy our joint episode. Welcome back to the Asia Chessboard. I'm Mike Green. I'm joined by my co-host Jude Blanchett and two distinguished policy practitioners. We're going to talk about the Bush administration's approach to China and Asia. This is the subject or one of the chapters in a new book from Brookings Institution Press called Handoff. And Handoff is a collection of uh, memoranda that were prepared by the Bush administration in 2008 in the transition period to assist the incoming Obama administration with policy towards not just China, but the entire world. Every part of the NSC was organized to produce these memos, review them with Steve Hadley, the national security advisor, and get them ready for the incoming team. This does not always happen in transitions, as I know from my own time entering the Bush administration in 2001. But even more uh, uniquely, uh, Steve Hadley got these declassified. So Handoff is a collection of what were once classified memos to the incoming Obama administration on how to handle the world they would inherit. And the memos on China and Asia were a key part of that. We're joined now by two other veterans of the Bush administration. I was senior director for Asia. I had left before this handoff, so I wasn't there for that, but I did work on the book with Steve Hadley. Faryar Shirzad was the deputy national security advisor uh, for international economic affairs. He reported both to Steve Hadley and to the national economic advisor to the president. He had multiple bosses in multiple parts of the world, but China and Asia occupied much of his time. He went on from the administration to Goldman Sachs and now is at Coinbase. And Paul Hanley, who served as director for Asian affairs covering China and the bilateral relationship. He'd worked that account uh, in the Pentagon and in the U.S. Army and had served as Steve Hadley's uh, assistant before moving to the Asia directorate. Paul is now the director of Carnegie China, uh, based in Singapore. So I'm going to turn the reins over to Jude, but I'm looking forward to it. I will be a subject or object of this inquisition, not the inquisitor. I'll let Jude do that. But in a program focused on strategy, this is an important discussion because so much of our current approach to China is based on assumptions about what our approach was in the past. So to get the strategy right going forward, you really got to understand what worked, what didn't, what assumptions we had before. So over to you, Jude. Well, thanks, Mike. And, and thanks, Paul and Fire, for, for joining us. This is, um, I, I had a chance to read through much of the book over the past day or so and, and just reread your contribution to this but before the podcast. And it really is just a, a, a fantastic document. And we're going to get into some of what Mike just mentioned, which is a reality check on what the actual state of the Bush administration's approach to China was. There's been some historical revisionism as of late, so I'd like to get into that. But but if I could first ask just a level set question, and as you write in the postscript, really no relationship or few relationships have, have changed as significantly as the bilateral relationship between the U.S. and China since uh, the end of the Bush administration and where we are today. I wonder if I could ask the three of you, looking at this in your own particular lens or vector, 
what was the state of the bilateral relationship? If we rewind the clock all the way back to, you know, the early to mid 2000s, how would you describe the relationship? What were some of the key tensions in the relationship? And as you write in the postscript, there were still some seen opportunities uh, or perceived opportunities. So so what were some of those? And, and Fire, maybe, maybe I'll start with you thinking about the sort of economic landscape. Could you give us um, a, a 35,000 foot view of what it looked like 20 years ago? Yeah, uh, no, I appreciate that, Jude, and I appreciate being a part of this. I think between Mike, Paul, and myself, the two of them are by far the bigger experts on the bilateral relationship and the evolution of China politically uh, and as a global geopolitical force. So I came at it actually from a perspective that's probably different but also useful for this discussion in the sense that I came at it as a veteran of uh, international economic and trade policy, uh, having been on the Hill as the International Trade Council of the Senate Finance Committee having worked on a range of trade policy matters, including having a very significant role in the PNTR uh, legislation that the Clinton administration was able to get through as a, that was one of the conditions of China's accession to the WTO. Um, And I would say the relationship with China was interesting. It was heavily focused around the trade relationship up until I would say 2001, 2002, when I came into the White House into 2003. And so in a funny way, with China having entered the WTO through the work of largely the Clinton administration, but the formal accession having occurred in the Bush administration, uh, the issue that we had in front of us in the Bush administration was very much how to take what was a trade relationship that had scale and was now largely governed by either domestic trade laws and WTO requirements and bring along the rest of the economic relationship into a much more mature trajectory. And when I say that, a lot of people don't know what I mean. And so let me explain what I mean. Uh, you had a bilateral trading partner that whose economic model was heavily, heavily organized around export-led growth. So their, their domestic economic policy, their external economic policy, a lot of their global relations as I could see it from an, as, a, as a trade and international economic guy, was organized around cementing access to international markets to you know be a continuing sort of point of output for their domestic economic model. And so it was a enormous focus that President Bush had us put on trying to get China to evolve its domestic economic policy from an export-led growth model to a domestic consumption-based economic model. And I won't go through all of that. We can go through that through the questions. But when you look at what that means, which means a lot of different reforms that have to occur within China to ultimately allow for the more efficient market-based allocation of goods, resources, and capital in the economy, it meant infinitely more than just the trade policy. And that's where I think a person like me coming into that relationship as a trade guy, struck by how immature Uh, many aspects of our bilateral engagement where we're China and how much work we had in front of us. So maybe I'll I'll stop there and then happy to kind of elaborate on that. Yeah, great. We'll we'll come back around to the economic relationship in in a bit as we think about where the relationship was nearing the end of of the Bush administration. Paul, I wonder if you can put your security defense hat on for a minute. We'd had, you know, things weren't particularly necessarily good in the defense realm when Bush comes into office. We had the 95-96 Taiwan Straits crisis. We had the accidental bombing of the Chinese embassy by by NATO. We had the EP3 incident. So I wonder if it was there discordant conversations on the trade side, which is a little bit more optimistic, and on the security side. What did things look like from your vantage point? Well, thanks, Jude, and, and thanks, Mike, for, for having me on. And I just want to back up and say a little bit about the book, Handoff. You know, I was here at a, a lecture uh, last week by a Singaporean professor, you, you probably know Jude, Kung Yun Feng, and he talked about U.S.-China, and he held the book up. And he said, you know, I was looking at past uh, policies of previous administrations in the U.S. I wish every administration would do something like this, because for professors and researchers like myself and students, it's such a useful tool. And I just want to say it took some political courage, frankly, on President Bush's part to do the transition memos. There were political advisors in the Bush administration who said it's a really bad idea if Barack Obama wins the election that you give the uh, members of the opposite party memos that lay out what you tried to do. They'll use it as fodder to criticize you. And he said what was more important to him was a smooth transition. So I just want to say that at the at the onset, encourage folks to listen to it. I think it really was a significant contribution to a smooth transition, and I hope future 
political transitions will take heed of that. You know, to your question, Jude, just in terms of the state of the relationship, I wanted to say a couple of things, and I can talk about the defense aspect. We have to remember that, you know, previous, even in the early days of the Bush administration, the U.S.-China relationship was primarily a bilateral relationship, dealing with primarily bilateral issues, economics, trade, people to people, difficult issues like human rights. What changed in the Bush administration was that China, through its you know, significant economic growth uh, and enhancements in power, gained influence on certainly in regional matters, but also, frankly, on international issues. And just to give you a practical kind of demonstration, a manifestation of that, I can tell you as China director under President Bush, when I would write a memo up for the president, either for a meeting with his Chinese counterpart or uh, on a trip to China, you know, I would write the memo and then invariably I would get several of my colleagues from the different offices, whether it was, you know, Mike Singh working on Iran or another colleague working on climate change or another colleague working on African issues or nonproliferation issues who would come to me and say, hey, you've got to have something in there for President Bush. China is becoming a key player on this issue. And so I think we were, in fact, the first administration to really have to deal with China on a set of global issues. And the president took an approach. Some describe it as naive today, and I want to take that criticism and accusation head on. But let me just say how he saw it. I think you saw before he became president in the campaign, he said he sees China more as a strategic competitor than as a strategic partner. And I think that was not clearly an indication of where he was going to go on his policy, but more a description of how he saw China. And there I would say he saw China both as a potential opportunity, uh, but also a potential uh, challenge. Uh, he saw opportunities in that there were voices within China calling for greater reform and opening. And if China had chosen that direction, it would have led to greater convergence between the United States, its allies, uh, and China. But there was no naivete. I mean, at the end of the day, China's a Leninist Marxist system, and it was clear that China could move in a different direction. And so while through engagement, the Bush administration pursued opportunities, tried to enhance cooperation, move along a path for a constructive relationship, the administration also pursued a strategy of balancing and hedging. And there, I think, clearly, you know, the point that you raised, there was also a recognition that watching Chinese military buildups in the region, that there was the potential really there for China to move along a path that was ultimately inimical to those, to our interests and those of our allies and partners. And I think today what you're seeing is the Biden administration is using many of the tools and policies that we put in place, whether that's our strengthened alliances with Japan, Australia, Korea, the Quad, which started in the Bush administration. And they're using the tools that were developed in the Bush administration in the event that China chose a different path. And unfortunately, that is seems to be the direction that the current leadership in China has chosen. Mike, same question to you. State of the relationship. I know a lot happened over the Bush administration, so I don't mean to be, uh, I don't mean to be holding this in time. But just, just for for those of us, just give us a sense of the zeitgeist on the bilateral relationship from your vantage point. Well, the first thing I would flag, and we have this in the book for context, China was the third largest economy in the world during the Bush administration. For most of the Bush administration, the PLA Navy was smaller than Japan's maritime self-defense force. It's now four or five times bigger, depending on how you count. So we were obviously dealing with a different China. The trajectory, of course, was towards growth and more power, but it was a different China than we see today. The other thing I think that was just stunningly different from uh, late Obama, Trump, and certainly the Biden administration experiences is that President Bush actually had a reasonably good relationship with Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. Um, he was unable to get Jiang on the phone and famously had to call him 11 or 12 times after the EP3 incident. And I think learned from that or took from that that the relationship is very underdeveloped, as Faryar said, institutionally and diplomatically, and a lot hangs on the leader's relations. So he kind of, like his father, became the action officer for China in many ways. And, you know, it was not a perfect relationship, but, you know, President Bush could talk to Jiang and Hu about religious freedom, about human rights. You know, he sent me to China in early 2005 with a letter for Hu, and Hu Jintao saw me personally for about 20 minutes and conveyed how much he wanted to work with President Bush. And I don't think it was a complete fake. I think there was 
a sense with Hu and Zhang that they did not want to challenge the U.S. That's very different with Xi Jinping, who clearly is is signaling publicly and privately he is going to confront uh, the United States and replace us. Um, so very, very different dynamic. Um, you know, so there was some basis for, for, for talking things through, and we could talk about it, but on issues like North Korea, um, even on human rights, there were concessions that came out of this personal uh, dialogue. That's gone now. I mean, John, who were different, she makes almost no concessions. It's all, you know, zero sum. And the last thing I'd say, though, is I was brought into the White House and met with President Bush, and he said to me in my first meeting with him, we're, we're going to keep engaging China, but we don't know if it's going to work, and we're going to need our allies, and we're going to need new partners like India. And that's why you know I want you to focus on that. And if you look at who went into the Bush administration, I think we had very, very top-tier China experts like Paul and uh, Ford Hart, Dennis Wilder, and others. But a lot, I mean, think compared to other administrations, a lot of the Asia team were um, allies, experts, Jim Kelly, Rich Armitage, myself, Torkel Patterson. It was a mix. It was not all about China. There was a lot of effort about building up alliances and partnerships. There were debates, which we can get into. There were big debates about China, as there are in every administration, as there are in this administration. But there was more to work with than what the Biden team has today. I just want to add on that. I think what Mike said is is terribly important. And it, it demonstrates, you know, that because in today's debate on this, you know, there is this idea that the administration didn't understand the potential challenges that China could present in the future. And clearly the way Mike described it, you know, President Bush saw that there was no guarantee that this was going to work out well, but he was wor- he was willing to give it a, a try. Um, and I think there's another good reason why, in retrospect, why it was worth trying you know, if you think about some of the debates today, if we had not tried to bring China into the international system, if we had not tried to work constructively with China, if we had moved immediately uh, to try to thwart China's rise or to build a more hostile approach to China. And as Mike says, there were debates and there were some calling for thing, you know, uh, an approach like that. In today's uh, environment, we would be criticized for being the reason that China has chosen to become more aggressive abroad and more repressive at home. A Bush administration would be blamed for China becoming our adversary or an enemy of the international system. Similar to the arguments you hear today about U.S. policy toward Russia, that it was the U.S. that somehow drove President Putin to invade Georgia and Ukraine because of our efforts to enhance NATO, large in NATO and, and uh, missile defense posture toward Russia, that we're somehow the reason that Russia is more aggressive. And I think you would hear those arguments today, but that's not what happened. I think the administration gave it a valiant effort to move along a more constructive path. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a, a guest on this podcast, but I'll just say on one quick point, I was living in China in the 2000s, and I have to say the most of the intellectual class, left or right, thought China was moving towards a more integrationist approach. And indeed, I, I wrote an entire book about a reactionary movement of ultra conservatives in China who also thought the, the Communist Party was leading China in a more reformist, integrationist perspective, and then so created a counter movement to try to rebalance against that. So when I hear the the flat historical narrative that since you know the Tang Dynasty, China was on a path to end up where it is today, I, I find that somewhat somewhat frustrating because there is a, a wide degree of agency and contingency that is at work in China's trajectory. Um, so I wanted to ask, I wanted to move on to the economic relationship again, Fire, but I wanted to ask one quick counterfactual to anyone who's who, who might have a, a thought on this, which is you do often read that one of the great geopolitical shocks that fundamentally changed uh, U.S. relationship with China was the global war on terror. That absent the attacks on America on 9-11 and the subsequent wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, that really sort of pulled what looked like it might be emerging policy of a more confrontational policy against China, based on some of Bush's comments when he was running for for president, that 9-11 then pulled the United States in a different direction, but also meant that China in some ways was strategically important to the United States as as it was thinking about the global war on terror. Two-parter, number one, Mike, maybe I'll go to you first. Is that right that the global war on terror really did pull the, the Bush administration away from what might have been a more competitive approach? And I think the counterfactual is what might have 
what might the, the Bush administration's approach to China look like? How might it have evolved if, if you know, we, we hadn't had the global war on terror sort of occupy significant bandwidth for, for the time that all three of you were in the White House? Well, I can tell you what seemed to uh, us like in the on the inside. I don't think that 9-11 or the global war on terror changed U.S. policy towards China or, or settled the debates. I think EP3 did that, the EP3 incident. Coming into the administration, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld and some had a view that we should be taking the kind of hard line on China we have today. Others at the State Department, I think the White House, thought we needed to pursue the policy we pursued, which was engaging but strengthening alliances and balancing. To me, it was EP3 that convinced President Bush of the path we had to take. I, I don't think anyone in the White House thought we, quote unquote, needed China for the global war on terror. What we needed for the global war on terror was um, a much broader set of relationships. And I can tell you, for example, in our negotiations with Beijing on North Korea and other tough issues, whatever you think of the global war on terror, the fact that the U.S. and its allies went into Afghanistan, um, went into Iraq, that visible demonstration of uh, an American readiness to use force when we're hit, that had a massive and huge impact on the Chinese thinking about the wisdom of taking on the United States, in my view. And I was palpable in things like the six-party talks and bilateral negotiations. Um, and I would also add that in the war on terror, and I've written about this, and I think the data is pretty strong, all of our key alliances in Asia got stronger. Public opinion got stronger. Interoperability and capabilities got stronger. What the war on terror did, though, was reduce the bandwidth and the amount of attention the U.S. could spend on Asia and the amount of resources, that's for sure. But I don't think it's accurate to say that because of the war on terror, we decided we had to be nice on China, to China. I never, ever saw that or heard that argument uh, in the administration. Paul? Yeah, I, I agree with Mike, and I think it's important to understand. You'll remember that President Bush went to Shanghai for APEC right after 9-11. And, you know, there's some speculation that there was great hope of more transformative kind of cooperation on, on counterterrorism or, or global terrorism with China. I don't think that was ever the case. I mean, President Bush, I think, was looking for a couple things. One, he did want, you know, to at least show the U.S. and China standing together, opposing global terrorism. I think he also wanted to just make sure shortly after 9-11 to let the world know that terrorists were not going to force the United States to hunker down into into a cave and, you know, not continue to be leaders in the international community. President Bush wanted to travel, um, go to an important regional meeting and show that the U.S. role was not going to change. It was not going to be, you know, put in fear because of what had happened to it. And I think also, frankly, the, the Chinese leadership appreciated it probably helped as well with the relationship that despite the fact the United States had gone through this event, President Bush was willing to get on an airplane and come to uh, China for, for the meeting. So I don't think it was to try to transform in some significant way our work with China on, uh, on, ta on terrorism and, and opposing terrorism, but it was to stand strong with them to show the U.S. is going to continue to play a global role um, and to get back out in the world shortly after the uh, disaster. For your, to Swing back over to economics for a minute. The Bush administration was really bookended by two pretty significant events in terms of the bilateral economic relationship. You know, one, we have the WTO accession in late 2001. And at the end of the Bush administration, towards the tail end, we have the global financial crisis. I wonder if you can give us a sense of between those two bookends, what were some of the key debates and challenges for the administration in working with China? And, and also, you know, outside of the broad goal that you laid out in your initial remarks, what were some of the micro goals that the administration had in, in strengthening its relationship with China or trying to blunt some of the, the negative effects of China's China's um, less inter integrationist behavior, to put it politely? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say this in a, in a way that could sound controversial, but I actually don't think there was much of a debate about what to do with China between those two bookends in the sense that you had this enormously consequential decision by China to undertake the reforms necessary to become a member of the WTO and the multilateral trading system. And then that, in a significant, significant way, transitioned China's trading model to one that, you know, again, operated under multilateral trading rules. But then what we had once we came out of that accession process was two very obvious work programs on the economic side. One is to ensure that they met their obligations, and that was that involved bilateral 
uh, diplomacy that involved the exercise of trade, special trade mechanisms under the WTO, the use of dispute settlement under the WTO, and then the use of uh, domestic measures, you know, safeguard measures, anti-dumping measures, and so on. And then on top of that, to augment that with additional trade obligations, sectoral agreements at the WTO, or uh, on a plurilateral basis. So in a way, the trade trajectory was quite kind of obvious, the WTO being a gigantic foundation on which additional disciplines and enforcement and compliance kind of building on the trade pillar. The second pillar, which I think was also obvious, was that you had a very immature economic model in China, as I mentioned before. You had a heavily export-led economic model that no matter how many trade disciplines you applied to it, still was built on a system in which they employed the two million people that entered their workforce every month by churning out more and more exports into, you know, into the global markets. And that, regardless of how vigorously you applied the trade rules, in the end was going to be unsustainable. And the real answer that had to be for the Chinese to transition to a domestic economic uh, consumption-based uh, uh, growth model. And so what does that mean? That means liberalizing their domestic financial services markets so that capital gets allocated not based on government direction, but based on economic and market forces. Uh, that meant depegging their currency. We put a lot of pressure on the Chinese to do that. They've transitioned, I forget now, it might have been 05 or so, into a, you know, a pegging towards a basket, which was a, you know, a, a baby step in that direction. Uh, and it meant essentially a lot of bilateral diplomacy to get the Chinese to essentially do the things necessary to liberalize their economy so that it wasn't trade that ultimately drove their their whole economic uh, model and ultimately supported their political system. And that involved a lot of complicated things that didn't have a kind of headline value in the way that WTO accession did or one-off anti-dumping cases may have. It also involved something which was fascinating to me when I came into it, is which we discovered that President Bush spent a lot of time and energy cultivating a relationship with the Chinese leader. So when I was there, Hu Jintao, and I guess it was Wen Jiaobao. And then there were relationships that we had between our cabinet members and ministers in China. But the real decision makers in China were the vice premiers. And at that point, we had almost zero contact with them. Uh, Paul and Mike will correct me if I'm wrong, but there were no mill-to-mill mill -mill engagements. I think the only vice premier we may have seen in the early years of the Bush administration was Wu Yi, who handled the trade portfolio because she was sort of the officially designated person. So we spent a lot of time, I remember, at least on the economic side, in trying to trace who the real decision maker were. You know, the ministers in China were ultimately there to you know, be the uh, kind of the front people to deal with uh, international government officials. But we were trying to develop relationships, not just between the president and the top, top leaders of the system, but at the vice premier level. And we set up a bunch of mechanisms, you know, the JCCT, and then later the strategic economic dialogue and other things to try to bring out more and more decision makers in their system so that we could have you know, kind of a more a broad-based uh, discussion that ultimately potentially catalyzed these changes that we were talking about. Now, those are two hard exercises, the trade thing and then the broader kind of economic reform project. But that was the period between those two bookends that, you, that you know, you're talking about. Just quickly on that, I think, I think overall I agree with Faryar. The economic and trade communication channels were, were much wider open you know, the aperture was much wider and the relationships were much stronger. Hank Paulson, as Treasury Secretary, had worked very closely with Wang Qishan, who was a vice premier at the time, in uh, his uh, time at Goldman Sachs, uh, knew him very, very well. And so, you know, there was a lot of attraction, a lot of movement, a lot of issues being discussed in that channel. Faryar mentioned the military channel. There were dialogues. And, uh, you know, I, I traveled to China with the then chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Richard Myers met with his counterpart. I traveled with the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, Doug Fife, for the defense consultation talks. Those were always subject to, you know, the ups and downs of the political relationship. If we had sold weapons or authorized weapon sales to Taiwan, the Chinese would cancel those uh, dialogues. So they were not mature. They were not off, often sustained. They were not as robust as what you saw, as Faryar is talking about, in the 
uh, economic and trade and, and commercial channel that uh, in the Bush administration. That that's clear. That was that was driving a lot of some of the forward movement in the U.S.-China relationship. I want to clumsily pivot, Mike, to the issue of Taiwan, which posed a number of challenges to the Bush administration. To put it lightly, we had the administration of Chen Shui-bian elected in in 2000 and then re-elected. We had a series of very dramatic and escalatory responses from Beijing. We had the 2005 anti-secession law. I wonder if you can put us in the room, and I'd like to hear from others as well, um, just put us in the room for, for some of the key challenges the administration faced in trying to maintain peace and stability, and really a unique period where we were also having to dual deter very forcefully with with, um, needing to send messages to the Chen administration, but then also needing to throw brushback pitches to to Beijing. I'd like to hear just some of your thoughts on how, how the administration navigated those challenges. Yeah, it was a tough, uh, it was a tough thing it, politically and in policy and in strategy. Again, for context, I think uh, it's worth reminding people that in the early 2000s, the U.S. had a uh, close to overwhelming preponderance of air and naval power in the Western Pacific. And the Chinese military strategy was primarily based on missile threats to Taiwan. Today, of course, uh, that balance has shifted and it's a much more contested environment. And the Chinese military strategy involves the entire first and second island chain in a sort of theater-wide campaign. So I mentioned that because the military risk was, was lower. Uh, there was more latitude. That was probably good because it was pretty tough to be to be honest. President Bush came in. In fact, the whole administration came in, uh, inclined to be much more supportive of Taiwan than the Clinton administration had been. The Clinton administration was pretty divided on Taiwan, and you know, in April two thousand one, in a TV interview, President Bush was asked, "What would you do if Taiwan was attacked?" And he said, "We would." I think Paul, he said, "We would rise up." <laughs> uh, we, would do, to help Taiwan. we would do what it took to defend Taiwan. Yeah. So, you know, something President Biden has, by the way, said four times uh, recently, but it was a big deal for the president to say that. And afterwards, he turned to Steve Hadley and Steve told me this on the record for my book and said, did I just pull the bandaid off our Taiwan policy? And Steve said, yeah. And he said, well, good. We need the world to know where we stand on this. The problem was Chen Shui-bian. Chen was a, you know, democracy crusader, a zealot with, frankly, almost zero geopolitical radar at all. And he abused it. He abused the support. He pushed towards independence. We sent from Washington very senior emissaries quietly to tell him to knock it off. But the administration had some people with deep ties who were, you know, sending mixed signals. And I think it was around 2004 when I became senior director that Condi and Steve and the president said, all right, we need one voice. And we basically had a uh, a process to pull together all Taiwan policy out of the White House, under the NSC, disciplined the message, and I think got onto a better place. But it was rough there for a while, but primarily because Chen Shui-bian abused it. And it, it, frankly, it was a symptom of the lack of dialogue we're able to have with the leaders of Taiwan. And we're in a much better place today with Tsai Ing-wen. I think the channels are very, very strong. She's very careful. She saw, she worked for Chen, of course, as the Mainland Affairs Council chair and premier she saw what happened. So I think we're in a much better place today. And I think it's good the administration uh, worked through it. It did not change our basic resolve under the Taiwan Relations Act and didn't change our one China policy. It managed to navigate those tough political, um, mostly type A based political problems pretty well. But it was not easy, as Paul will recall. Yeah, you know, I, I was China director for one year during Chen Shui bians reign in power. And then the, the second year of my uh, time as China director it was Ma Ying Zhou. And um, the the contrast is uh, quite stark between uh, those two periods of time. I agree with you 100 percent. I mean, it's you know, we we're fortunate to have Tsai Ing-wen. I think she and I think the Chinese have made a big mistake by not trying to to engage her, you know. But but back during that time when Chen Shui-bian, as you say, was, was really pushing the envelope, it, it reminds us that strategic ambiguity is not just important for our approach to the mainland when it comes to Taiwan. You also don't want to give a blank check to Taiwan because you don't know at the end of the day whether what ta- future Taiwan leaders, uh, what you know, agendas they may have and whether or not those are in line with our own interests and, and the interests of peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait, which is our ultimate aim. Um, but clearly it was deemed by President Bush fighting a war, I might add, in Afghanistan, also in Iraq, 
Uh, the idea that President Chen, Chen Shui-bian would, would put at risk a potential conflict in the Taiwan Strait was not something that was deemed in U.S. interest. And you, Mike, were a big part of uh, sending messages uh, both, uh, you know, in person, but also through other representatives. Um, and the point did not seem to be being understood. So it was a difficult period. But I think I would just say, end by saying, you know, I think it was clear we stood with Taiwan. That was not ever a question that we were fulfilling our obligations under the Taiwan Relations Act. That was never a question with uh, leaders in Beijing. We opposed the, the use of coercion uh, by China or the use of force to try to reunify with Ta- to, to unify with Taiwan. We um, also made clear we did not support Taiwan independence. The, the, the one thing that came out in the Bush administration that's important to mention is there was a new formulation um, because of primarily what was going on with President Chen Shui-bian that is still today used, which is no unilateral change to the status quo by either side. Um, And I think overall, those elements were a pretty good formula. It wasn't always easy, as Mike said. There were tensions, contentious issues to deal with. But overall, I think the approach served to maintain stability on the Taiwan issue over the eight years of the Bush administration. And I think if you look back, I would count that as a success. So I wanted to put one forward-looking question to to each of you, and and hopefully that will stick the landing uh, for for the discussion, but we've really just scratched the surface. And of course, this is designed in many ways to get everyone to go over to whichever bookseller you you, you use and to to buy the book, which is really just an incredibly rich uh, source of of insights. Um, But, you know, Faria, maybe I'll, I'll start with you, which is you now have had this very deep private sector experience. Also, before that, as you were mentioning, looking out on, on the economic policy landscape, I wanted to put your 35,000-foot hat on and wanted to get your thoughts on this this key debate now on how do firms and countries even, market economies, how, how do they remain integrated with China? Where is the integration sticky and like likely to endure, but where are new geopolitical realities, domestic developments in China, regulatory developments in market economies as they respond to China's sort of neo-mercantilist behavior, where are we likely to see disintegration? Um, This is something, we use the word decoupling just sort of on a left-right spectrum, which feels insufficient. We probably need a, you know, an eight-dimensional decoupling model to capture the, the, the realities. But I, I'd love your thoughts on where you see this this moving. Yeah, it's a great question. It lends itself to a podcast in and of itself, but let me give it a shot. I think if you look back in the 90s and the 2000s, we were entering into the period of statelessness where we were all kind of parts of the global community operating under global global rules and companies operated around the world as uh, local citizens in the local markets in which they served. I think all of that has changed. You now, as a multinational, uh, carry the flag of your home country and you try, and if you don't, you do so at your own peril. I think companies are being asked very clearly uh, to be American companies, to be very clearly unambiguously American uh, everywhere that they operate. And executives are held to account to that. Some of it occurs, you know, obviously in hearings or public settings, but much of it occurs behind the scenes in closed door sessions much more often than I had ever seen before uh, and much more, you know, candidly and bluntly than I would have thought. I think there's a bipartisan consensus uh, with regard to China and the United States, House, Senate, Democrats, Republicans, successive administrations, Trump, Biden, Obama, it doesn't matter. Uh, that there is Team America, and then you're either on it or not on it. Uh, and I think American business has to respond to that. On a policy front, I think, you know, people, I think a lot of things have happened. The financial crisis happened, but COVID happened as well. Uh, the stresses on our supply chains, you know, the whole model of a glo- globalization ultimately proved its intense limitations where we thought that there are a lot of sort of simple light manufacturing occurring outside of our borders was okay as long as we maintain the high-end sort of IP and kind of services end of the economic model. I think everybody understands now that you have to have a broad aspect of economic activity in your own country for social development reasons, for um, economic resilience reasons. And so now you're having companies that have to operate uh, informally under an expectation that they represent the United States, and then more and more now between outbound and inbound investment restrictions, tightened export control restrictions, 
and likely to soon come outbound investment restrictions with the government setting much more clearly the perimeter of what global what globalization looks like and what American companies operating internationally can actually take with them. And that was almost unlimited or significantly unrestricted back in the day, and that's becoming more and more restricted. Paul, um, you've lived, I think, in China longer than any of us on here, and, and you're still actively engaged through the Carnegie Tsinghua Center with Chinese intellectuals, Chinese policymakers. I wanted to get your thoughts on recent statements coming out of Beijing and what they might portend for shifts in Chinese strategy, particularly the the framing that came from Xi on the margins of the MPC, where he talked about in, in specific terms, whereas before he would speak of the United States like Voldemort, he, he would not mention it. It would be he'd refer to us as, as some countries or, you know, hostile powers. But now specifically calling out the United States for a all around containment and subjugation strategy. Less do you think we're subjugating China? But more importantly, I'm curious what you think that statement and framing uh, pretends. Um, was that just a response to Biden mentioning she in the State of the Union? Or does this indicate that China has just shifted a gear, you know, from third to fourth gear in its approach to the bilateral relationship? It's a great question, Jude. Uh, and I think it's probably a little bit of both. I do think that, you know, frankly, Biden's comments in the State of the Union are not particularly helpful. Well, I think uh, President Xi and the leadership pro there didn't probably appreciate those. And as you suggest, he may have been responded in kind in their own national meetings at the, at the NPC. You know, frankly, we've seen now General Milley. I saw Evan Greenberg, uh, former uh, chairman of U.S.-China Business Council, calling for kind of ratcheting down the rhetoric on Taiwan. And I think you could extend that, frankly, across the broader relationship. I think we would be better off if we and, – and certainly there's been a general improvement from what we heard in the Trump administration – but clearly, the Chinese uh, rhetoric is toughening. It's getting, you know, much more wolf warrior kind. But it would it would make sense for us to try to do what we can to kind of put a floor under the deterioration of the relations. To try to just over the over the short term and the near term get get some more stability in the relationship. And we heard uh, President Xi's comments at the NPC calling out specifically the U.S. And that's unfortunate because, Jude, nobody knows better than you that what that means is the whole system now will study those remarks and they'll integrate it into their own approach in whatever lane they are in and what they're doing. And that, so that'll have a, a longer term effect than just in the NPC. But, you know, we also, I should just, I'll end here by saying in Bali, we also saw the inclination of both leaders I think, to try to be more constructive and put the relationship on a more stable footing, despite the fact that in the long term, the structural challenges are going to continue to put downward pressure on the U.S.-China relationship. But maybe precisely for that reason, uh, they tried to do a couple things to get the relationship on a better footing. One was to sustain high-level dialogue. And coming out of the biden Xi meeting, you know, we saw John Kerry meet his counterpart, our Secretary of Defense meet his counterpart. We saw some assistant secretary level meetings in uh, Beijing. That was all scuttled because of the balloon incident. Um, and I think that we ought to try to get that back on track if we can, because uh, what you don't want is for this more competitive environment the pushing back that both sides are doing on each other to ultimately, you know, bleed over into into conflict or greater confrontation. And so in the short term, I think we need to sort of try to ratchet down the rhetoric as much as we can. Over the long term, we're going to have to, there's no other possibility but to develop a set of principles and operating mechanisms that despite the growing list of differences can help the two sides manage the relationship so that, you know, again, we don't find ourselves in conflict, which was neither good for the United States, for China, or for the international community. Mike, final question to you, and, and I'll, I'll let you also give the final benediction and close us off. But one of the other framings that's coming from Beijing 
is they look at the totality of, of security architecture that is legacy security architecture that the United States is helping to revive and give some new impetus to, along with other partners like the Quad, new security architecture like, like AUKUS, and they're painting this as sort of Asian NATO. Take aside the, the accuracy of that. I see no Article 5 commitment in, in, in AUKUS or the Quad. But just to this, I, I wanted to ask a specific point, which is something you and I and other conversations have had and something you've been thinking about a lot is shaping the environment around China. Thinking about this, this sort of patchwork or this weave work of, of security architecture that um, the United States, but also where, where you are in Australia, but other partners like Japan and increasingly others like, like the Republic of Korea, uh, the Philippines. What does this lead to? What is the sort of – what is this new – status quo or equilibrium that we can create with this security architecture that can shape China? And, and in what ways do you see it helping to contribute to some sort of peaceful equilibrium? Going back to the book, I just reiterate one thing Paul said um, in the beginning, which is you look at all the key pillars of the Trump and Biden approaches to shaping the environment. They're all things that were started, or almost all of them, not AUKUS, but almost the re- all the rest were started in the Bush administration. And to give credit, a lot of it came out of the Pentagon in the Clinton administration, where some of us, Randy Shriver, myself, who went into senior jobs in the Bush administration, had worked for Kurt Campbell, who's now the Biden administration's senior Indo-Pacific coordinator. There's a lot of continuity from one administration to the next. But the Quad was formulated in 2000. Uh, five, uh, four and five after the Boxing Day tsunami by the U.S., Japan, Australia, and India to provide public goods, humanitarian relief, and have these navies and, and governments work together to underscore resilience in the region. That was an innovation that, of course, we now see blossoming as the key part of um, President Biden's strategy in the region. The emphasis on Japan, the trilateral security relationship with both Australia, Japan, and Korea, Japan, and ourselves, and India, uh, perhaps most important of all, the India relationship was stalled. There was there was no strategic dimension to it at all until some of our colleagues in the Bush administration, like Ken Juster and Steve Hadley, worked through the painstaking issues of peaceful nuclear cooperation space. All these things that had been that had been obstacles to a fuller strategic relationship with India. All that is now bearing fruit, and I think has very broad bipartisan support. Not only in the U.S., but in all these countries. You look at Australia, where you went from a, a coalition on the right to a labor government bashing the hell out of each other, but not on the alliance, not on the quad, not on Japan, and not on AUKUS. So there's a bipartisanship to this that's in the U.S. Congress, in the think tank community, broadly speaking, and in many of our allies. It's not going to be as easy as NATO because these are still bilateral relationships. And the multilateral ones like like the Quad, plurilateral like the Quad or AUKUS don't have uh, Article 5 collective security arrangements. So as we deepen our bilateral security cooperation and network our alliances, the role that all allies will play in a contingency is undetermined, frankly. We sort of know in a Taiwan contingency what Japan and probably Australia would do, but there's a lot of a gray area. And this is going to take some real finesse by my military planners, by diplomats here and with our allies. But the other thing is we now rely more on our allies to shape the environment than we did during the Bush administration. That's a big difference. The relative balance of power has shifted in ways where we need Australia, Japan, Korea, and India, and the Philippines for geography, for military firepower, for diplomatic influence. And you can see that in the Biden administration's Indo-Pacific strategy. It mentions allies 33 times. But the, bur- the business of listening to allies and adjusting, we're, we're, we have a little bit of um, work to do on the U.S. side. And probably more than anywhere, that's in the area of economic statecraft, which we've talked about again and again. I, I think what you asked earlier, did the war on terror sort of change the U.S. approach or change U.S. China relations? I think what really did it was a global financial crisis, which completely changed you know, Xi Jinping and Chinese assumptions about trajectory of global power. And it didn't break American support for alliances, which is very strong, but it did kind of break American support for the existing trade and economic statecraft. And we've not, no one's had the political courage to put that back together. And you can't shape the environment unless you've got an economic component to it. And as we've discussed, all of us, IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, isn't enough. So that part, I think, you can't go back to what we had in our memos. You can't go back 
to the, the economic policy Farrar put forward. It's not going to happen, but we've got to rebuild an economic dimension to shaping the environment because IPEF is a start, but it's, I think it's pretty thin. Well, I want to thank all three of you for coming on tonight. And again, this would make another plug for everyone to go purchase the book, which we've just talked about China, but there's chapters on the Middle East, there's chapters on North Korea, there's there's chapters on Russia. It is an incredibly rich source. And as I hope has come out of the conversation tonight, you can't understand the present without understanding many of the challenges, emergent solutions, as Mike just mentioned, that came out of those critical eight years that Bush was in office. So thanks to all three of you. Thanks to everyone for listening. And I hope, Farya, I think you're in the U.S., so I hope you go to bed soon. Paul, Mike, I hope you have a great day and see you next time. Thank you for listening to the China in the World podcast. For more episodes and research, please go to carnegieendowment.org. This episode was produced by Nathaniel Schur with assistance from Wang Yuanhang and Michael Malinconi. The music was composed by Spencer Barnett.